The name John Bass alone should be a household name. It should be taught in schools and be as recognizable as the name Kardashian or Jake Paul. Gunnery Sergeant John Bassalone is not only one of the greatest Marines in United States history, he's one of the greatest soldiers, period. A true American original and an icon. This channel is all about telling the stories of the men and women who have helped make this country so exceptional through their sacrifice and devotion. And nobody fits that bill better than John Bassalone. We profiled some extraordinary Americans over the past six months, but as an Italian from New York who has spent many years in New Jersey, I have to say that John Bass alone holds special significance. There are some names that simply stand out to paisanos of a certain generation from the East Coast. DiMaggio and Sinatra come to mind, and I would also include John Bass alone. Okay, he might not be in that category any longer, but for a long time after World War II, John Bass alone was as recognizable and esteemed as those two, and frankly, anyone else. It's true, look it up. His World War II heroics were well chronicled, well known, and deeply appreciated by a country desperate for authentic heroes. He was held up as an exemplar of what being American was all about, and his name should be never forgotten. John Bassalone's story begins at Raritan, New Jersey, which back then was rural farm country. He grew up in a large Italian family with nine siblings, and like most kids of the Depression era, was more interested in trying to hustle for a buck or two than sitting through school. He drops out at 14 and has aspirations of being heavyweight champion of the world like his hero, Primo Carnera. He does some boxing, caddies at a local country club, performs odd jobs here and there, and mostly just knocks around aimlessly. While caddying one day in 1934, he has a premonition. It'd be the first of several in his life where, as he put it, the normal voice in his head went silent and a new voice spoke to him with crystal clarity. So what does this voice tell him? That somehow his future would be impacted by Japan. He doesn't know what it quite means. After all, it was Germany and not Japan that was making most of the noise with their increasing belligerence but right there he decides to enlist in the United States Army. A strong voice indeed. <laughs> he goes through basic training, and as Bassalone would say years later in an interview, he takes to soldiering immediately. He loves everything about it, the discipline, the structure, the purpose, and the sense of fraternity among the men. He becomes a machine gun gunner and is good at it, and I mean really good at it. There's nothing quite like the feeling of pure thunder in your hands is how he describes squeezing the trigger of his beloved Browning machine gun for the very first time. That's amazing. So Bassalone shifts off to Manila in the Philippines and quickly earns a reputation not only for his gunnery, but of all things as a boxer. He's a standout on the Army boxing team and puts together an impressive 19-0 record, so much so that promoters back in New York and Chicago get wind of Manila John, as he's known, and they try to entice him with professional bouts when he returns. While he likes soldiering, he grows disillusioned with the army itself. Remember now, it's the late 1930s, and they're mostly drilling on how to retreat to an island called Corregidor when the inevitable Japanese invasion occurs. He absolutely detests the idea of learning to run backwards, as he puts it, and when his enlistment is up, he shocks everybody by just going home. He returns to New Jersey, but quickly finds out that civilian life, at least for him, is no better. He struggles to hold down a job and desperately lacks the structure and order that the Army provided. It's 1940, and his life has hit rock bottom, when one day he hears that voice again. And it's even clearer than the first time. It tells him that he should be back in the Pacific. So what does John do? He enlists in the Marine Corps. I'm guessing it's pretty unusual, but not altogether unheard of, for an army soldier to re-enlist as a Marine. But John Bassalone is no ordinary person, as we'll find out. So being a Marine suits Bassalone to a T. They practice amphibious assaults and attacking maneuvers, not retreating, and in his bones, he just knows that war with Japan is inevitable, 
and he wants to be part of the crew that liberates the Pacific after it's overrun. That's pretty clairvoyant stuff. He's not surprised in the least by the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he's just itching to join the fray after watching the war go badly during the first part of 1942. So Bassalone finally gets his chance at Guadalcanal in the fall of 1942. The campaign to take back the island and its key airfield is a critical one, and he's part of the second wave of Marines tasked with holding the airfield and keeping the island. Like all the Pacific fighting that the Marines would see, places like Peleliu and Tarawa, Saipan and Iwo Jima, it is beyond brutal. It's just savage, almost hard to comprehend. It's gruesome and costly, and Barcelona is truly a leader among men. On the eve of October 24th, during the battles for Henderson Airfield, Barcelona and his unit come under attack from 3,000 Japanese soldiers with machine guns, mortars, and grenades. Starting with just 12 men, nine of whom would eventually perish, Barcelona goes without food or sleep for the better part of three days, doing nothing but firing his machine gun and occasionally running through hostile territory to resupply it. At one point, he was down to just a pistol and a machete to turn back the attack, which he does, by the way. As one of the other surviving Marines put it, Barcelona had a machine gun on the go for three days and nights without sleep, rest, or food. He caused the Japanese lots of trouble, not only firing his machine gun, but also using his pistol. For his heroics, Barcelona was awarded the Medal of Honor and he sent back to the States to do a bond tour to raise money for the war effort, which back then was pretty normal stuff for war heroes. So it's what happens next that truly makes Barcelona one of the all-time greats. Imagine it now. He's traveling around the country raising money, with movie stars no less, speaking to large crowds every night, raising money for the war effort, being hailed as a hero, and written up constantly in the media. He is a genuine celebrity. There are parades in his honor. He's recognized wherever he goes. The guy never has to pay for a meal or drink again. So he can have a pick of any desk job he wants. And what does John Bassalone want to do? He begs the Marine Corps brass to send him back to the Pacific. I mean, he knows how savage the fighting is going to be. He knows that the chances of surviving a second tour of duty are slim. He knows that if somehow he survives, he'll be completely hollowed out as a person. But there's John Bassalone begging to go back. The Marine Brass repeatedly deny his request. There's no way they're sending a beloved war hero back into battle. But somehow his persistence over the weeks and months ahead wear them down. Bassalone believes that his experience will be invaluable in taking the newer recruits through some of the brutal island fighting and he wants nothing more than to just be with his boys. His family is horrified that he wants to go back, as is his new bride, but the voice in his head tells him he's needed back on the islands. It's where he belongs. I won't be coming back, he prophecies to two of his siblings just days before shipping out. And on February 19, 1945, there is John Bassalone in the first wave of the invasion of Iwo Jima with his boys. His unit hits the beach and they're immediately pinned down by a torrent of machine gun fire and mortars. Barcelona crawls up to several machine gun nests and takes them out, allowing his men to advance off the beach. He sees an American tank stuck in the mud and under intense artillery barrage, and he frees it up to get the assault going. It's there that he's hit with mortar fire and killed. John Bassalone's heroics helped the Marines get off the beach during the early part of the invasion, and for it, he was posthumously awarded the Navy Cross, the second highest Marine Corps decoration for valor. To this day, he's the only enlisted Marine to earn both the Medal of Honor and the Navy Cross. Along with his hero and mentor, Chesty Puller, John Bassalone is regarded by many to be among the finest Marines to have ever served our country a distinction he's rightly earned. There isn't a Marine Corps base around that doesn't have a Bassalone Way or a Bassalone Drive. He's still honored every year in central New Jersey with a Bassalone Day Parade, and his heroics are recounted for every new recruit 
is part of their education into what it means to be a Marine. He was portrayed by actor John Seda in the HBO miniseries, The Pacific. If you haven't watched it, it's worth checking out. It really brings to life his heroics on both Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima. John Bassalone died while doing his duty to the utmost with his boys. On his left arm was a tattoo that simply read, death before dishonor. For John Bassalone, those weren't empty words, but a way of life. 